it was unreal from start to finish. Although he'd been ill, he was home again and getting better, even playing a gig or two. But the headlines said, dead at 71. Television showed it and radio told it to the world. As much a major story as the deaths of the Kennedys and Dr. King. Some blacks had called Armstrong the white man's favorite Negro. Yet the lines around the corner and down the street, the tens of thousands coming all day to pass the open casket, were predominantly black. His left hand held a handkerchief, a showman's touch that Louis would have liked. The worn spot on his upper lip was smoother now and still. That spot had moved against the mouthpiece of his trumpet. There, that spot on his lip, that's where it all came from. The sound that changed music around the world. Look at it for the last time, and remember you saw it. He was wealthy. A townhouse, a swimming pool, a guard at the gate, no. A modest house you'd never notice and wouldn't find unless you knew the number and the street in Corona, Queens, New York, or saw the rubber mat at the doorstep marked the Armstrongs. Today, black limousines were parked outside. American flags hung half-mast from all the houses. Louis had been a friend, helping the neighbors raise their children and then their grandchildren. The tiny church was as hot as a summer afternoon in New Orleans, and soon the television lights for Telstar would make it even hotter. It wasn't New Orleans, though. No bands, parades, or jazz. A quiet organ played, as Louis had said he wanted. You had to have a ticket to get in. You couldn't help noting the famous faces under a blazing sun outside the church, thousands cheered when New York Mayor John Lindsay arrived. Afterwards, they cheered Moms Mabley. Lindsay brought New Orleans Mayor Moon Landrew. They were joined by New York Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller. Father Norman O'Connor sat with Lutheran pastor John Gensel. Dizzy Gillespie sat with Guy Lombardo. Catherine Basie was there, and Edward Kennedy Ellington II, and Mrs. Edmund Hall, and Lil Hardin Armstrong. Arvel Shaw, Tyree Glenn, Joe Moraney, and Marty Napoleon. David Frost, and Dick Cabot, and Doc Severinsen. George Avakian, George Ween, and Nessui Ertigan. Ella Fitzgerald, Harold Arlen, Benny Goodman, Jean Krupa, Ornette Coleman, Zutty Singleton, Wild Bill Davison, Jonah Jones, Lee Castle, Bill Clinton, Jimmy McPartland, Marion McPartland. Leonard Garment from the White House, Mark Lewis from the State Department, Willis Conover from The Voice of America. They weren't celebrities at all. They were simply friends of Louis. Cy Coleman went to the piano to accompany the singers. Peggy Lee, always best prepared, lights and mics, always rehearsed and ready, began softly singing the Lord's Prayer at the altar. Noticed the microphone wasn't amplified, but continued anyway in the near whisper she had chosen as appropriate. Blind singer Albert Hibbler guided by tenor saxophonist Walter Foots Thomas, sang Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen, and a slow, quiet, out of tempo when the saints go marching in. Broadcasters Billy Taylor and Fred Robbins were subdued and dignified in the pulpit. Taylor's voice breaking with emotion once. Robbins in a moving eulogy, directing a friendly warning heavenward. Move 
over Gabriel. Here comes Satchmo. He will not leave thee, nor will he forsake thee. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. You would know the secret of death, but how shall you find it unless you find it in the heart of life? The owls whose night-bound eyes are blind unto the day cannot unveil the mystery of the light. If you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. For life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. In the depths of your hopes and desire, lies your solid knowledge of the beyond. And like seas dreaming beneath the snow, your heart dreams of spring. Trust your dreams, for in them are hidden the gates to eternity. Your fear of death is but the trembling of the shepherd. When he stands before the king, whose hand is to be laid upon him in honor. Is the shepherd not joyful beneath his trembling that he shall mar the mark of the king? Yet is he not more mindful of his trembling? For what is it to die but to stand naked in the sun? and to melt in the wind. And what is it to cease breathing, but to free the breath from its restless tide, that it may rise and seek its God unencumbered? Only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed see. And when you have reached the mountain top, then you shall truly dance. When the earth shall claim your limbs, then you shall indeed begin to climb. Rest eternal gift to them, O Lord our God, and let thy perpetual light shine upon them. The congregation will remain standing until the invocation of prayers given by Father McManus. Lord Jesus Christ, we gather here today not so much to mourn our brother Satchmo, whom you have called to his eternal resting place, but rather to welcome him with you and your angels and saints into the land of the living. In baptism, he was reborn into your body. Today, you have called him to join you. We know what must be taking place in your kingdom today. For wherever he went in this world, there was always jubilation and happiness. Today, we know that there is a certain awesome jubilation and happiness in your kingdom as he marches into the eternal halls of heaven. May the angels lead you, Satch, into paradise. May the martyrs await your coming. And may the God of Abraham of Isaac and Jacob, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, welcome you into eternal glory. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be 
ำคัญไดเวลบีดันอันเอฮซิดีเ
recorded in the 27th Psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon the rock. I had fainted unless I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. As ministers of this church, we welcome you to share in this tribute to the memory of the life of Louis Armstrong. It is difficult for us in this community and in this church to fashion words that would speak to you our innermost and our deepest feelings. And perhaps this would be needless in a way because anything that we would say today would be unmatched by the life and the gift that we have known and shared in the voice and the horn of Louis Armstrong. However, very briefly I would just like to say especially to those of you who are young and whose life is yet before, yet before you, that we have a legacy that is left to us by Mr. Armstrong. And very briefly I would say, perhaps the uppermost thing that you would want to say to the young today, to not neglect that gift that is in you. Lee Armstrong had a gift and he was born at a time when it was not very easy to live. We know of hardships and disappointments in our day and time at this moment in history, but it was even more so difficult for a man to stir up that gift that is within him and to keep his eyes on goals that would lift him above his immediate situation. So his legacy would be, I would say in this regard, you have a gift and man don't neglect it. Secondly, I would think that he would want it to be said that to use that gift to bring joy and happiness. We would not make light of death at any moment. It is a mystery for the most part to most of us. But I would hate very much to see this tribute turn into one that is grounded in sorrow. 
Louis Armstrong used his gift to bring joy and happiness to countless millions around the world. I remember some time ago he said that when he was traveling in the Congo, when he arrived there, those cats were out there in the field shooting at each other. When they heard old Pop, those cats dug it, they dropped their guns and came up to the car shouting, Mo Satchamo, Mo Satchamo. So this is the kind of thing I think that we want to remember out of the life of Louis. And to his wife, as a word of comfort, as a minister of this congregation, I would say to you, though he may be absent in the flesh, you know more than any of us those things that kept your hands to the plow, that brought you the kind of life that you can enjoy now, that enabled you to overcome the disappointments and the sorrow and the, the burdensome travels of your early experiences together. Hold on to faith and to hope and to love because when all else is done, they will remain. And finally, we all should remember these words that he uttered, I think, at his last public appearance. I want to thank the Lord, said Mr. Armstrong. I want to thank all of you, for you all have been good to old Sachimo. Immediately following the next musical selection by Mr. Porter, the eulogy will be given by Mr. Fred Roberts, a longtime friend and of Mr. Armstrong, who is a New York disc jockey. thou hast lost. 
whom the gods love die young, no matter how long they live. One of the world's greatest men was gone. One of the last of the true giants. He was an artist of such extraordinary ability that he is above all possible praise. With deep, profound sadness, it's a great honor for me to pay him homage with these few words. He didn't learn to sing in Milan. He got his voice training with a New Orleans newsboy quartet. He used to chirp on the curbstone for pennies. He didn't learn to play the trumpet in a conservatory. He practiced on a battered old bugle in the New Orleans Waves home for boys. His professors were the sons of Old Man River, the musicians who worked on the Mississippi River boats. He was born back in town in the slums with every possible obstacle before him. And yet his genius took him across the world to triumphs in concert halls, command performances before kings and presidents, audiences with popes, and millions of words of critical acclaim by music journals of every country. His great records have spread the gospel of jazz to every nook and corner of our planet. His influence on music, on singers, on musicians has been tremendous. There's a little bit of pops in every one of our best popular artists. And wherever jazz is played, it's Louis's music they're playing. He was the source. Jazz is a term that is much abused, but if it has any meaning at all, it means exactly what happens whenever he lifted that horn, whenever he threw his head back and curled his voice around the song. Jazz is our great cultural contribution to the creative art of the world. He was its symbol, and its greatest contributor. He made it part of a global culture, and he was nothing less than a true legend in his own lifetime. He was our most gifted and infinite creative musician, a genuine American folk hero. Pops's true greatness came most of all from his simplicity and his love for music. He was in love with his horn and it was in love with him. Only such a love affair could have brought forth such a beautiful tone with such warmth and spirit it melted everything he touched. And how he bubbled with spirit and pleasure when he sang. His famous smile was radiant incandescent it seemed to light up the stage and he personified the word genuine in everything he was and did as an artist and as a man he was the greatest ambassador of goodwill our country ever had certainly the most famous american he knew what communication was about and he spoke to millions through his music and his exhilarating performances in almost every part of the globe he used to say, a note's a note in almost any language. And if you hit it, beautiful. They dig it. For he believed that the world needs love. Then and now. And no one spread more joy to the world than Pops did through his matchless magic as a musician, as a master showman. And he was loved in return. How he was loved. By people everywhere. By royalty, poets, peasants, in the Middle East, in the Far East, in South America, in Africa, where he was carried into the stadium on a canvas throne. In Sweden, where thousands would meet him at the airport and wait all night around his hotel. He was deified all over Europe. In Russia, his records are collector's items. And when he played as a soloist with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in London, before the royal family, 
Sir Lawrence Olivier introduced him by saying, listen to this beautiful, this noble character, for that's what he is. Play some rather basic music. And what a sense of humor he had. It was a mother wit. It was earthy. Nurtured in the back streets of New Orleans, on the coal carts, on the river boats. It was honed and sharpened all over the world through the thousands of people he met and the things he experienced. He was a marvelous storyteller. He had a funny story about anything and everything and everybody. You could give Pops any subject or mention a name and he'd unreal a story that would have you rolling on the floor. Anyone who knew him has his own favorite story that Pops has told him. And with it all, in this amazing career that spanned 55 years and brought him such continuous universal recognition and honor and fame, he was basically a modest, unpretentious, simple man, devoted to his wonderful, dedicated wife, Lucille, who gave him 30 years of great happiness, was devoted to his home here in Corona and his friends and neighbors. It was my great pleasure to be at his home last Sunday to spend part of his 71st birthday with him, as I have in the past. He was in excellent spirits. He said he'd been gaining weight. He was able to warm up on his horn. He was spending his time transferring his records to tape. He was looking forward to going back to work in the fall. It was heartwarming to see some of the young boys from the neighborhood drop in to pay their respects. And typical of the graciousness and the nobility and humility of Pops as he thanked them for doing so. They were part of yet another generation that warmed to the magnetism of this remarkable man. He always believed in staying before the public. He loved having his record of Hello Dolly on the top 40 and playing before high school and college audiences. I'm not worried about my younger generation public, no way, he told me. We play high schools and universities and all the kids come and they just rave. They still dig old such. He would tell youngsters, you've got to appreciate all kinds of music to be a good musician yourself, classical and everything. It's good to always listen to the other fellow. Music is music. Ain't but two kinds of music, good or bad. So I try to play as good as I can at all times. And if it sounds good to me, it's got to sound good to everyone else. He told me once, I don't have time to worry about getting older. The way we work all the time, travel all the time, here and there, you don't even think about that. The main thing is, just live. Enjoy life. You have to stay young to play music and feel what you play. And his credo was simple. I never tried to prove nothing, just always wanted to give a good show. My life has been my music. It's always come first. But the music ain't worth nothing if you can't lay it on the public. The main thing is to live for that audience because what you're there for is to please the people. Well, he pleased the people, all right. More than that, Louis Armstrong captured the essence of human relations in what he did. The feeling, the mood, the spirit, and the hope of mankind. So move over, Gabriel. Here comes Satchmo. And the saints are marching in. And so Pops takes his place as the king at the head of that big jam session in the sky in that special niche in heaven that God keeps to hold our idols with Billy and Fats and Johnny Hodges and Bird with Tommy and Jimmy and Bessie and Big Sid and Ziggy, and Jack Teagarden, and Bunny, with Edmund Hall, and Billy Kyle, and Pee Wee Russell, and Dinah, and Velma, and Sidney Bechet, with Davy Tuff, and Mildred Bailey, and Coleman Hawkins, with Nat Cole, and Claude Thornhill, and Jimmy Lunsford, and Glenn Miller, and Wes Montgomery, 
and Tad Dameron and Bud Powell, Charlie Shavers, and on and on and on. Louis Armstrong was a lovable, beautiful, darling man with a beautiful soul. He loved all kinds of people. All kinds of people loved him. He had a full, rich, rewarding life. It was an epic, and he had a ball. He spread a lot of sunshine around, and all those he touched are richer for it. And the world is a whole lot better for his having been in it. For as long as there are ears to hear, his music will be played and enjoyed and studied, and he will endure. He was truly the only one of his kind, a titanic figure of his and our time, a veritable Picasso, Stravinsky, a Casals, a Louis Armstrong. In his musical autobiography, the writer Gilbert Milstein quotes seven lines from a novel called The Circus of Dr. Lowe by Charles Finney, which fit Louis' life perfectly. I'd like to close with it. For he wanted to make one hell of a show. And the things you'll see in your brains will glow long past the time when the winter snow has frozen the summer's fur below. For this is the circus of Dr. Lowe. And youth may come, and age may go, but no more circuses like this show. It was one hell of a show. Bye, Pops. Marching in Oh, when the saints Go marching in We know he'll be Up there In that number When the saints Go Oh, when the road is called up there Oh, when the road is called up there We know he'll be in that number When the road is cold up there Oh, when the sun refused to shine Oh, when the sun refused to shine We know he'll be up there in that number when the saints go
was covered with red roses and a small red sash with the words, my darling. It was borne slowly up the center aisle, out of the church, down the steps, into the hearse, and away to the cemetery. GMT, time for World Report on the Voice of America, an hour-long review of the day's major developments in the news.